doing these devotionals this week and appreciate you tuning in. You know, the last couple days we talked about a relationship with the Lord. And I wanted to end in Psalm 37. A lot of times when I asked by a teenager to sign a Bible, I'll sign Psalm 37, 4. And I'm going to turn there, Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5. I'll tell you why here in a minute. I often say to the teenagers, what if I could tell you there's a way you could get exactly what you want in life? Would that interest you? I mean, who wouldn't be interested? Here's the key. It's in Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So when you delight in the Lord, he says he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, some people think, well, so I always wanted to be a professional basketball player, or I always wanted to be, you know, fill in the blank. So God's promised me that? Well, that's not what it says. Yeah, but it says if you delight in him, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, one of two things happens. First of all, to delight in him is to put him above everyone else in your affections, your desire, your devotion. When I got married, I so delighted in Angela, Angela Westberg, that I asked her to be my wife. And that meant she became my wife to the exclusion of any other romantic, intimate uh, relationship in life. She's my one and only. So to delight is a word that says, I put the person in an exclusive position. Now, when you delight in God, one of two things happens. Either he changes desires that are flesh-driven, or he fulfills desires that are God-given. So let me explain. When I first got saved, we were in a church that didn't preach the Bible, and I had got addicted to heavy metal rock music. So as a young teenager, and I... I'm just telling it the way it is. I'm not pleased with my past, but I was into ACDC, Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, heavy metal groups. So I start going to a Bible preaching church, and some of the kids in my youth group said, what kind of music do you listen to? And when I told them, I said, don't you know that's bad? I mean, I just thought it was music, right? And they said, here, you should read this. They gave me a comic book called Spellbound, and it was by Chick Publications. And it showed the morality of music uh, from a Bible perspective. And God sure changed my heart, and I remember saying, Lord, if you show me this music's wrong, I'll give it up. And one night, my parents had been going to this week-long preaching conference, and they came home talking about what they learned on music, and I, I'll never forget the night. I was so convicted. I went and I tore up all the, uh, the LPs, the albums, and the tapes that I had, and, and, and God changed my heart. I started listening to godly music, and I remember, you know, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. God changed my heart. And, you know, after about two weeks, I didn't miss the rock music anymore. I started liking the godly music. So new appetites freed me from the old desires. So I had a flesh-driven desire. What did God do? As I delighted in him, he started renewing my desire, gave me the desire of my heart. Uh, I'll give you another example. When I was 15, the Lord worked in my heart to surrender to full-time ministry. Lord, I'll do whatever you want with my life, but... I was, I was afraid. I was reluctant. The reason was, I had a feeling God might call me to be a preacher. Well, d didn't you like preachers? Yeah, I like preachers. I thought a lot of preachers. I just didn't want to be one. Well, and you may think, well, that's kind of contradictory. Well, the reason was, you've got to be up in front of people and talking if you're going to be a preacher. And that's not what I wanted to do with my life. So I remember thinking, oh, all right, I'll surrender to God. But I have a feeling he's going to make me a preacher. But one night, we had a missionary lady share her testimony. She said, you know, in God's army, he doesn't draft, he recruits. And that made sense. He's looking for volunteers. We'd been singing the song, A Volunteer for Jesus, in my Christian school. And you might have heard it. A volunteer for Jesus, a soldier true. Others have enlisted. Why not you? Jesus is the captain. We will never fear. Will you be enlisted as a volunteer? So that night, I went forward at the invitation. I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. And... I just knew I was crying. I just knew the Lord was going to have me be a preacher. And sure enough, he did. Well, about, I don't know, maybe a month later, I preached my first message in our Christian school. And I'll tell you this. I loved it. And ever since then, I have loved to preach. Now, that wasn't natural. That was supernatural. So here, here's the exchange. I delight in the Lord. Now, he gives me the desires of my heart. In, in one case, there was a flesh-driven desire the example of music I gave it. So I delight in God, he began to change that. In the other case, 
I didn't want to do something that was really a good thing. So now I'm delighting in God, and guess what? He gives me that desire. And, and, and this pattern was uh, perpetuated throughout my life. I remember I loved to travel when I was a kid. Uh, my dad took us camping all the time. Mom and dad, they took us camping, and I loved traveling. We went from New Jersey to California in 1976, saw the whole country. I thought, man, this is the life. I love travel. When God called me to preach, I thought, oh, I'll probably be a pastor in some church my whole life. Never, you know, I probably won't even have an outdoor window to see the outside world. But little did I know God would have me be an evangelist. And so, who gave me the desire to travel? God did. So now some of you might be thinking, oh, so like if I become an evangelist or if I surrender to God, then I'm going to go to Hawaii every year. Not necessarily. God will give you the desire that he has for you. And, and if you have desires that are not in line with his, he'll change them. Uh, let me go to one more place here in the psalm. Drop on down to verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Okay, so the steps of a good man are ordered. They're directed. They're steered, if you will, by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Who delights in his way? He, the good man, delights in God's way. That goes along with verse 4. How do, you, how do you know that? Well, the next verse. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Some people say, well, it says he delighteth in his way. How do you know it doesn't mean that God doesn't take pleasure in the good man doing what he should do? How do you know it means the good man will delight in God's way? The way I know is context. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Let me ask you this. Is God going to fall? No. So it's talking about the good man. The good man has steps directed by God. He, the good man, delights in God's way. Though he, the good man, fall, he'll not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholds him with his hand. I remember in high school, I, I fell for this girl that uh, she and I graduated co-valedictorian, and we were voted most likely to succeed. And, oh, I probably should tell you, we were in a class of 13 students. I probably should give that caveat. Uh, so this girl and I took a fancy in each other, started dating in high school. But my parents just didn't have peace about it. And I remember about three weeks before graduation, they, they said, you know, you just need to break off this relationship. Three, three weeks before graduation. I'm 18 years old. What do you do? I know God says, honor thy father and mother. So I didn't feel like doing it, but I, I broke it off. And she and I ended up going to the same college, Christian college. But amazingly, when we got to college, we went two different directions. It wasn't that she was a bad girl. She just wasn't God's choice for me. Her dad always made money. She grew up and stayed in, never left New Jersey. I grew up, my path would not be the route of money, and I would not stay in New Jersey. God had different plans for us. So I saw God's hand in that. Well, I got to my junior year of college. I had never um, found the girl, and my girls always say, well, you did your part, didn't you, Dad? I would ask girls out, you know, go to dates at college or whatever. But uh, I didn't want to have senior panic. So senior panic's where when you get to be a senior and you haven't found the right girl, you just marry the first one that comes along. So I, my, I said, my senior year, I'm not dating anybody. And um, it's funny, I ended up asked to travel with an ensemble, a singing group. As a preacher, I was a preacher, but there was this blonde soprano in the group. And no, those of you who know me, it's not Angela, who's my wife. Um, I'll call her Mary. That's not her real name, but I'll protect identities here. So Mary and I traveled in this ensemble, and I just fell for her. I thought, this is fantastic. I wasn't looking, and the Lord put us in the same group, and I came back to college, and we started going to everything together. We were, we were starting dating in chapel, um, sorry, church services and soccer games or whatever. Well, my parents had moved to Pensacola at this time, and they said, uh, I noticed you and Mary hanging out a lot. Yeah, she's a great girl. I met her on some. Uh, just be careful. I thought, oh, man. You know, my parents are like, be careful. I, th I figured I'm the, I'm the firstborn. They just don't want empty nests someday. So they'll just never let the firstborn get married. Well, I remember one summer, um, I was going to the wilds to be a counselor. My parents were helping Ron Comfort start Ambassador Baptist College. My dad was a builder. And Mary was traveling in a group in North Carolina. So all of us were in North Carolina for the summer. And I remember my parents saying, you know, we just are not really sure about you and Mary. And I said, Mom, Dad, if you, don't, if you can't give your blessing on this relationship, 
I need to know because I'm falling deeper and deeper for this girl. And I said, could you give me an indication at least one way or another by the end of the summer? And they said, all right, we'll pray about it. So all summer, I'm writing letters to her. She's traveling. I'm praying. End of the summer comes, and my parents said, well, we've seen that you're really serious about her, and we think that we can give you the blessing. I thought, yes, okay, so I'm going to go full hog in this. Well, guess what? Her parents then did not have peace about this. And so we went from my parents not having peace to her parents not having peace. And I learned a long time ago, the scripture says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. I think that's uh, Proverbs 10, 22. So he, his blessing, there's no sorrow mixed with it. Well, now our parents don't have peace one way or the other. So I started fasting and praying, God, please change her parents' heart. And I fasted for two days. And one day out of the blue, my parents called me. I'm now traveling as a college rep for PCC. I'm in Virginia at the time. And my parents tracked me down at the hotel where I was, called me up and said, hey, can we talk to you? Everything okay? Yeah, it's about you and Mary. Is she ever, is she heard everything? Yeah, she's fine. Rich, we don't have to tell you this. We just don't have peace. And short story is, I'd been fasting for two days about this and asking God, Lord, I may be wrong about this. I don't think I am. But if I'm going to be, if I make a mistake here, it's going to affect the rest of my life. Lord, please don't let me hang myself if I'm about to do the wrong thing. And now my parents call me. No peace. Well, I broke it off that night. Didn't want to, but cried my eyes out in the hotel. And I remember thinking, man, I am, I am, uh, was it 23 years old? And now I have no girlfriend and I've just graduated. And when will I ever get married after this? So I remember coming back to college after I'd traveled and my friends were there. And they said, so are you going to start over? I said, start over how? Are you going to date anybody? Um, my parents would never approve of anybody. And two of my closest friends, uh, Tim Zacharias, who's now assistant pastor at Campus Church, and Greg Bryant, who had become head of promotions down at PCC, they both said, have you thought about Angela Westberg? I said, oh, the piano player. She had traveled with Mary in an ensemble. They said, you ought to ask her out. I said, oh, my parents would never go for it. I think I'm just going to be single the rest of my life. They said, ha, you're being single is about as likely as the Pope getting married. Uh, that's not going to happen. You're not going to be single. And they said, you want to see what your parents think about her. So one day I said, hey, mom, dad, you know Angela, the piano player who traveled with Mary? Yeah. Well, my friends are telling me I'd ask her out. And they said, now that's the kind of girl you should have been interested in all along. And just to fast forward this whole story, I prayed that God would let me meet her parents. They traveled in evangelism. One week later, I met them in, Penn, uh, in Maryland. We went out, we talked. I said, I've met your daughter, I'm interested in her. Could I have your permission, your blessing to date your daughter? They said, absolutely. I said, this may sound kind of forward, but I've been praying about this. Lord, if you want me to marry, you're gonna have to put all this together. So if God led this toward marriage, I don't wanna start down that road and you say, uh, we don't have peace about this. Could we pursue it as far as the Lord would let us? And, and they said, you can pursue this as God leads. And my future mother-in-law said that night, that's the guy that's going to marry our daughter. And I just had met Angela. But the amazing thing is when we got married, her parents were all for it. My parents were all for it. And you know what? I, I know this. I know I married the girl God had for me. And I love Angela more than I ever have. And I'll tell you this, to do the will of God is not drudgery. It's a delight when you do God's will with a surrendered heart, you end up doing what you want to do. So let me ask you this. Is there some area that you're hesitant to surrender? No fear in surrender. There's no regret in surrender. When you delight in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Thanks for letting me share this week. God bless you.